Okay, I'm recording uh, this audio lecture uh, in order to start discussing Plato's Gorgias. Um, this lecture is des designed to get us into the dialogue a bit and uh, discuss some of the basic ideas, the main ideas of that dialogue. Um, first of all, where does this dialogue begin? Where where is it placed? Well, it's it's actually taking place at first on a street, which is pretty typical of the way a lot of uh, Platonic dialogues start. They start in a informal setting, and uh, and the people speak informally as friends, or at least as acquaintances. And we see, um, in no short order, we see several characters. We see Socrates, Chaerophon who seems to be an admirer of Socrates, but also of uh, Gorgias, the subject of the dialogue. We also meet Callicles and Gorgias himself, and Polus, who appears to be a student and admirer mainly of Gorgias. Anyway, so these fellows meet up on a street in Athens, and it's clear that uh, Gorgias has just given a demonstration speech. Gorgias is a ambassador from uh, in a, a Greek city by the name of Leontine, or Leontini, and uh, that's on the island of Sicily, actually. He traveled from place to place as a ambassador, but also as a teacher of rhetoric, and he made a lot of money getting students to pay him to teach him this art. Well, Callicles says to Socrates, hey Socrates, you missed Gorgias's uh, declamation, which is just a fancy word for speech, his demonstration speech, and, uh, you know, you get the sense right away that Callicles and also Chaerophon and others would like uh, Soc Socrates to have had that experience. Uh, Chaerophon and Callicles actually volunteer Gorgias to declaim right there on the spot, to give a speech, and you get a sense that they don't really care what the speech would be about. Gorgias is the type of man who can give a speech about just about anything without any sort of prior preparation. Uh, he's had a lot of experience at this and he knows what he's doing. So you get the sense that it wouldn't be hard for Gorgias at all to uh, give a speech right on the spur of the moment. Gorgias is somebody who is good at what we call extemporaneous speaking. Uh, he has something to say about every issue and uh, he is quite capable. You get the sense this is a very a, a truly an expert. So anyway, um, Callicles goes ahead and invites everybody back to his home uh, to do this, and this was a typical setting also, you know, people would move indoors, uh, they might recline, have some, uh, say have some wine and some food, and uh, settle in so that they could really enjoy themselves. But Socrates kind of throws a wrench into things, because he says, well, you know, I don't want to just listen to Callicles give a speech, I want to ask questions, not just listen to him. And, of course, this sets up the opposition between Socrates and Gorgias. Um, they both sort of like each other in the sense that they enjoy each other's uh, personalities, so to speak, but they do not agree, as we'll find out, on the value of rhetoric. And there is an opposition in this dialogue that develops between what we call dialectic, which is the mode in which two, usually two people, but sometimes more, argue with each other, um, ideally, ideally, the aim being that uh, the parties will eventually agree, and the mode of rhetoric, which is speech making, and whose aim is not agreement, so to speak, but persuasion. And we will be learning more about what the difference is, but agreement assumes that both parties would then understand things exactly the same way. Persuasion is different. Um, in Gorgias's view, it's not necessary for people to actually agree about the same things in order to be persuaded to do something the speaker wants them to do. So we'll find more out about that as we go into this. So Gorgias's goal is to make opinions through speeches. And, uh, you know, we understand pretty soon that Socrates doesn't think that opinions are as valuable as knowledge. He believes that knowledge is possible. It's possible to know something and to transmit that knowledge to others, whereas Gorgias uh, seems to think the best we can do is forming opinions. Now, if we look at the opposition from Socrates' perspective, opinions are not as good as knowledge. Opinions are based upon impressions and emotions, and therefore they're easily changed by the next emotive speech 
or just by time intervening and people feeling badly about what they previously did. Knowledge, on the other hand, is based upon facts and direct experience in his view, and so it is not so easily changeable. And I'm sure if you think about it, you can see that one of the problems Socrates had with democracy is that so many of the people's decisions were based upon opinions, and those opinions were based on emotions, and so they were very easily changeable. And, uh, you know, people would decide this way one day and that way the next, and it made for a chaotic uh, situation in a lot of ways, especially in foreign policy. You know, the Athenians once famously sent out ships to an island called Mytilene to basically punish them for revolting against them, and they were going to kill every man uh, on the island and enslave the women and children. And uh, the next day, another speaker got up and argued that they ought not to do that, and, and they changed their mind, and they had to send out ships to uh, hopefully catch up to the first ships, which they did, thankfully, uh, and stop them from, from killing all these people. So you can see that would uh, uh, be fairly inconvenient for Athenian foreign policy sometimes. Anyway, Gorgias is not so sure that there's anything other than opinions in the political world, and so he's not too keen on the idea that uh, that the speaker ought to try to uh, transmit knowledge to other people. He's good at forming opinions in people. He's a rhetorician and a teacher of rhetoric, as we know. Now, if you think about it, there are advantages to, to both forms of communication. There are certainly advantages to um, to uh, the form of dialogue because, for one thing, uh, a person can answer questions. They, they can stop and clarify. If you don't understand what the, your partner's argument really is saying, you can stop and, and have them explain it further. Um, you can interject and go off on a, on a tangent, as, if it's relevant, um, that, uh, that will help you understand. Uh, you cannot be uh, bamboozled very easily when you're sitting right down in front of somebody and, and uh, they, they, they have to be confronted by your opinions and your uh, opposition. So there's a, a great advantage there. Uh, a disadvantage, though, is that uh, sometimes emotions get involved in that dialogue. It's not easy to have a clear-headed dialogue, especially over issues that are very important to us, you know, like moral issues and religious issues. I mean, you know, uh, many people decide, I'm never going to have a conversation with other people who disagree with me about politics because that will simply lead to hurt feelings, and it often does. Uh, because, you know, you're face to face, you start uh, having a conversation, but it turns into an argument, and pretty soon it's out of control. Um, so having a good dialogue depends upon people remaining uh, fairly calm, <laughs> which is not always easy for people to do. Uh, when you think about it, there's advantages and disadvantages to speech making as well. Speech making from the audience's point of view is is uh, great in the sense that they can get the person's whole argument and understand it, hopefully, if there is one that's good there. Um, but they may not be able to ask questions at all, and even if they are able to ask questions, it's at the end of the thing where they may not remember everything the person said, uh, and there's usually only so much time for questions to be asked. And again, the person can answer those questions any way they want. They don't have to actually answer the questions. A great advantage of speech making is you can't give, a, a, you can't have a dialogue with a large number of people. Um, you have to give a speech. Uh, there's no way that a person can sit down with a nation and have conversation, no matter how hard they try to do so. <laughs> um, so anyway, th those types of, of issues are brought up at the very beginning of this dialogue. You know, the, the difference between dialectic and rhetoric, uh, the advantages and disadvantages of both. We see this, this opposition running throughout the dialogue. Okay, well, the conversation uh, begins there on the street, or actually, excuse me, in, the, in Callicles' house. And Chirophon asks Gorgias, uh, because he's sort of been urged to, um, can you really answer whatever anyone asks? You know, he's been urged to ask uh, Gorgias, what, what is it that he really does? And he says, can you really answer whatever anyone asks? And uh, before Gorgias has a chance to answer, his young student Polis jumps in. And Polis says, well, for heaven's sakes, put your questions to me, Cherifon, if you please. 
Gorgias, I'm afraid, is all tired out. As you know, he's been through a great deal of speaking already. And Cherophon says, Really, Polis, do you think that you can make better answers than Gorgias? Polis says, What does that matter if they're good enough for you? Uh, this appears on page 4, near, near the Stephanus number 448 on the side of the page. What does that matter if my answers are good enough for you? Polis says. Now, obviously, Polis is kind of a hothead. So maybe that's one thing we're supposed to get out of this, that, you know, Polis is a student of Gorgias, and what does he do? He just jumps right in there, emotion-laden, okay? And he's angry, uh, he's, he's arrogant, maybe we're supposed to get that, but he does give a, li a little bit away about what he's learned about rhetoric in, in that last statement when he says, what does it matter if my answers are good enough for you? Well, uh, Gorgias will teach his students to size up their audience and to give them more or less what they want to hear. Don't give them more knowledge than they need or contradictory facts or um, other people's opinions. You know, give them only as much as you need to in order to make them agree with you. So, we can say maybe of rhetoric at this point that one of its goals is is to persuade by giving uh, the audience what is good enough for them and no more. But uh, we'll have to learn a lot more about what Gorgias himself thinks of it. Um, now Polis does answer. He says that rhetoric is the quote noblest of all arts. Okay, well Socrates seems to imply that this is defensive and maybe it is. Maybe he's covering up for his insecurity and so forth. But um, but we do learn a couple of things. We learn that for Polis, rhetoric is an art, and I think you'll find that in this dialogue they do have an argument about whether it's an art or a knack. Is it something that you can learn and actually uh, improve the quality of what you do through your learning, or is it simply sort of a, a talent that you are born with, the gift of gab, more or less? A and we also learn from Polis's answer that it is, in his view, the noblest it's on top of all the others. And that's actually quite a claim because, you know, as Socrates will point out, what about medicine? What about the art of doctors or physical trainers? Um, you know, what about the art of the builder, uh, the person who constructs all the great uh, buildings in Athens? What about those types of people? They might say, uh, or the businessman, he might say, hey, you know, I make this whole economy work. And without me, I, you know, who, people would have no jobs, they wouldn't be able to eat. What's more important? Or the farmer, okay? So that's quite a claim. Now Gorgias jumps in and generously, uh, you know, he's a better man, I guess, than Polis. He doesn't get angry. He, he really never gets angry. And he's very open uh, with Gorgias compared to Polis. And he says, well, I'll answer that. Rhetoric's my art and I can teach it. But then that gives Socrates the in to uh, ask further questions. So he says, well, what is the aim of rhetoric? What's its end, its goal? Gorgias then says something very similar to what Polis says, which is that uh, rhetoric is the greatest of all human concerns. Rhetoric's aim, I should say. Now, um, but he does back that up. And this is the big difference between him and what, and what Polis did. He tells you why it is the greatest of all human concerns, and he's got quite an argument. Um, on page 10, just above number 453, Gorgias says, I mean the ability to persuade with words judges in the, assemb judges in the law courts, senators in the, assemb in the Senate, excuse me, I'm reading ahead of myself. I mean the ability to persuade with words judges in the law courts, senators in the Senate, assemblymen in the assembly, and men in any other meeting which convenes for the public interest, since it is perfectly true that by virtue of this power you will have at your beck and call the physician and the trainer, that business man of yours will turn out to be making for money for somebody else, not for himself will he make it, but for you who have the power to speak and persuade the vast majority. Now there's insight. Gorgias says, first of all, that it is the ability to persuade with words. There are other ways to persuade which are less convenient and cost more, namely force and bribery. Okay, So think about that. He's saying this is the easiest way, the less costly way, the less risky way. And then persuading judges, senators, assemblymen, and men in any other meeting 
convening for the public interest. So it's aimed at people who can make things happen, make decisions. If you have that power to persuade, then you have at your disposal the doctor, the trainer, the businessman, the farmer, the builder, and so forth. So this is the reason why he says it is the greatest of all human concerns and why Polis says it's the noblest of all arts because it's on top of them. Because literally, the politician can direct how the other folks do their jobs and what for and how important they are and so forth. And notice, he can take the money from them. The businessman of yours will turn out to be making money for somebody else. Now that's a, you know, it's sort of an odd way to think about taxation at first. You know, it's so bald-faced, basically. We get your money and, and we and we spend it for what we want. But when you think about it, you know, I mean, it's a plausible way to view uh, taxation. So, you know, he's not maybe rich himself. Maybe he was, but uh, you wouldn't have to be rich yourself personally to be a rich politician because the politician has the wealth of the entire nation potentially at his disposal if he's persuasive enough. Okay, so Gorgias uh, says that, that what he is doing or what he teaches others to do is to persuade the vast majority to do what the speaker wants. Now that issue is what really gets Socrates, okay? He really doesn't like that part of it. I mean, it's bad enough that oftentimes rhetoric is about opinion and emotion and so forth, but it's, it's about, for Gorgias, getting what the speaker wants, not using rhetoric to get what is best for the people. And, and, and Socrates wants to make that type of distinction. What's good for the speaker is one thing, what's good for the people is another thing. Now, despite that, Socrates and Gorgias do agree to a certain extent on what rhetoric is, they just disagree on uh, its value and its purpose. For instance, up at the top of page 14, Socrates says, and Gorgias agrees with this, the rhetorician then is not a teacher of law courts and other public gatherings as to what is right or wrong, but merely a creator of beliefs, for evidently he could never instruct so large a gathering on such weighty matters in a short time. And Gorgias says he certainly couldn't. So they really agree about that. Um, and you can see here that Socrates wishes very much that the rhetorician could be a teacher instead uh, of a, a creator of beliefs. But he acknowledges that's very difficult because public gatherings are large and the time span is short. And how can you possibly teach people about right and wrong, good and bad, about what is truly good for their lives in such a short time, in say one hour? You can't, in his view. Now, nevertheless, I think you'll find that he doesn't totally give up on the idea that a rhetorician could exist who uses rhetoric for closer to that aim. In other words, instead of using rhetoric to simply get what the speaker wants in order to feel power to gain and wealth and so forth, he does hold out the possibility that there might be a rhetorician possible uh, who would use rhetoric to make people better, to make the country better, to put his own self-interest aside. And this, this is the Socratic ideal of the statesman. Okay? The person who is able to put self-interest aside, who can lead, who can lead the, the crowd, but do so for the purposes of, of their well-being. And that would mean maybe even uh, uh, having to have a higher level of that art form because the, such a speaker, the statesman, would have to persuade people sometimes to do things they didn't want to do, things that were painful, um, that they didn't like to hear. Okay. Um, and that's, uh, that's, that's a tall order for most speakers. All right, well, well, well I'll just leave you with this uh, question, which is, uh, you know, the, both of these guys bring up that the crowd is rather uninformed, and this is a great limitation on whether you can really teach them anything or really communicate with them. And Gorgias says it's, it's insurmountable. Um, and I just want you to think in your own lives and in, in today's political uh, climate, is being uninformed still a problem? Okay, we're not talking about ignorance in the sense of stupidity, but ignorance in the sense of not having enough information. 
uh, both of these guys say, you know, people oftentimes don't have enough information to really make a good decision for themselves. And this is why they're so easily manipulated by the public speaker. Is that still a problem? We have way more information at our disposal than ever before. We certainly have vastly more than the Athenians ever had. Most of their information was from word of mouth, okay? But we have television news, and we have the newspapers and magazines, and all the information that's available to us on the internet and on radio, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, we're just practically drowning in it. And yet, uh, I know, even I, I, I mean, this is what I do for a living, um, I find it hard to keep up with all the areas of the news. I'm so busy doing my job and doing my research, which I have to do, and and um, then I have a family, and boy, I'll tell you, I, I almost always get to the news at the end of the day, as far as the, you know, the broad spectrum of what's going on in our country, uh, but it's not as much as I would like, and I'd like to find a way to squeeze in more, and I value it greatly, and there are folks who who don't, you know, for whom it is not evident that they ought to spend very much of their time uh, trying to figure out what's going on in, in the world and in their own country. So um, just something to think about. Is this still relevant, this issue of the people in a democracy being uninformed and then perhaps because of that not as qualified as we would like to think in, uh, to rule a country? All right. We'll see you next time.